Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at H&M.com. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. David Yudis about successful talent management and development to drive organizational success. David Yudis, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to have the chance to, to talk with you about uh, talent management, HR, um, leadership within organizations, and you come to us with such a really great background um, professionally and educationally. Uh, and so I'll, in just a second, I'll share a little bit about your bio uh, with the listeners um, but first, really, I just want to say welcome. Uh, it's really great to have you here. It's great to be here. And I, I think this is a critical topic. You know, I, I don't think we can underemphasize the importance of having the function that really looks at the people. I think it's all about the people. People are what make things happen in organizations, and that makes things happen in the world. So it's great uh, focus. Awesome. Awesome. Um, David. Uh, David Yudis is a relentless champion of organizational talent. He invests in people and working collaborations with clients. He, decrease, he decreases the distance between them and their next success. David's talent development is grounded in his experience as a senior human resource executive and management consultant in a variety of organizational settings. Um, David has his doctorate in psychology, his MBA, his master's uh, in education, and a bachelor's degree in psychology, and a number of uh, professional uh, certifications, uh, and really a, a great background and expertise in talent management. Uh, so again, welcome, David. Anything you would like to add um, by way of just kind of personal introduction um, before we really launch into our discussion today? So I, I really appreciate just the touch on the background. Um, here's what I would say. I'm a business psychologist and I am really focused on the people. There's two things I do today in running my business, which is potential selves. And that's executive coaching. A um, couple situations I get heavily involved in, usually with senior leaders, which is um, working in leadership transitions. That is oftentimes when someone has recently been promoted and or someone has been assigned or received a new major task that could be a new organization, it could be launching a new business line, it could be something focused around the P&L directly, and or when someone is seen as future leader, but not necessarily received that promotion. And so an organization is looking to um, get them skilled up or support them in the best way to get them ramped up to get to that position. The other focus is really around team effectiveness. And that's some fascinating work, John. Sometimes they go hand in hand, but I've been doing a lot of work around senior teams, um, their chemistry, how they get things done, and how they work with one another to ultimately drive to the success of the business. Awesome. I love that framing. Uh, and I think everything you just mentioned is so incredibly vital. In, in the best of circumstances, those are all vital elements to successful organizations. Um, but given the current cli business climate, the global economic climate uh, surrounding the, the pandemic, uh, I think it's even heightened um, in its importance. 
and our ability to attract and retain great people, to develop our people, to help them transition and move into senior leadership roles. Everything you mentioned is, is so incredibly important. I'd like to mention as well, John, just one line you used there that, that's really important to me. Uh, and it really captures what I'm about. I do believe in my work, in my life. I invest in people. That's really what I do. That's about the work I do. So investing in people means, you know, I really try to connect and, and link with them, see where they're at so that we can get to where they're trying to go. And by doing that, I think there's always major return on investment. Absolutely. I completely agree. So let's talk about talent management, talent development. Um, what do you, what do you, in your experience in working with, in coaching leaders and working with organizations as a consultant, where, what have you seen as the major gaps um, and maybe pitfalls, shortfalls of organizations when it comes to how they manage and develop their talent? It's a great question. And one I think, um, I think about in terms of where is the focus? So where are leaders focused? Or maybe a better question might be, John, where should leaders be focused as I'm thinking about it? And, and we'd be remiss, you and I, I think, if we don't stop for a real quick moment and just acknowledge where we're at um, in, in history, in time, in current climate, right? When the midst of, at some form, hopefully further along and maybe at the back end, that's my hope, but we're still in a pandemic moving through it. And we're at a real inflection point in terms of society, in terms of connection with people, um, in terms of Black Lives Matter. Uh, and, and what we're seeing come out for people in the day to day. And I think organizations have to recognize that. So where leaders focus is really critical. And I believe the greatest gaps are there. Here's the way I like to think about that, John. I call it, it's, it's like a C-suite, right? A C-suite notion, if you will. And I think about it in this way, four C's. Firstly, to communicate. I just think we are social creatures and communication in and of itself cannot be understated. So communication or lack thereof to go back to where is one's focus is just critical. Second C for me is concern. And concern is all about empathy. You know, where do you stand today? Where do people feel? What is the pulse of the organization? Where is the culture of my climate? I think leaders need to be able to think about concern, and by having concern, it shows empathy. Third C, for me, is connect, and that's all about reaching out and making a connection. Again, we're social creatures, we're social species. You know, the ability to connect is really, really important, and again, something that can't be missed. And if we take our eyes off of thinking about it, we may not actually try to connect. It's also possible in today's world that has recently been much more about virtual connection. We don't, we don't turn the camera on. We don't reach out. And so connect is really important. And for me, in the focus, the final C, the fourth C, is all about collaboration. And I think that brings us back really um, to the human capital space and to HR. Collaboration is all about leaders connecting with their people and ultimately collaborating to get to success. I love that framework and I love those C's um, and, and they're all uh, people driven, right? Uh, connection, uh, compassion um, and, and, and collaboration, you know, getting, getting to the heart of how people interact and work with each other is at the core of successful organizations. Uh, and it's about relationships. It's a, it's about uh, compassion and empathy for people, understanding where they're at, listening to them, and then helping everyone to be, be their best selves and to maximize their potential, right? That's really, truly what it's all about. Um, what, 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 what is your approach when you go into an organization and you see a particularly challenging um, transition occurring? Um, how, what do you do to help um, coach and mentor and, and consult with that organization and that leader? to help them get ready for their, their new uh, professional role? 
Well, you just mentioned some words that are really kind of near and dear to me, and, and I think you captured some things that are great, but you used the word selves and you used the word potential and achieving it. I mean, that really is the name of my company, which is Potential Selves. And I'll just share that as a framework that I did a lot of research on years ago when I was working on my doctorate. And here's what's interesting about Potential Selves. You know, there is real science behind understanding or thinking about what are the futures that we truly want to create for ourselves. And though that's easy to say and think about, perhaps, if we don't actually take actions to enable what those possible futures may be, there's no way to reach them. And so the tagline for my company, Potential Selves, is realize your possibilities. I share that with you because when I walk into a company about, you know, walking in and seeing, I think any time a consultant is being called into a company, there's probably some form of challenging situation. But for me, I'll go back to another C now. I think context is really important. So first, what's the context? What's the referral? Let me understand where is a person, where is the department, where is the leadership, where is that organization at this point in time? So that's context. You know, where have they been and where are they at at the moment? And by the way, as a business psychologist, when I hear some of the descriptions of that context, I'm often thinking about or looking at what's not being said. Sometimes in communication, what's not being said is more powerful than what is being said. And so that's something contextually that's really important to understand. Next, I'm looking at what is it that that uh, leader or the person making the call in uh, is looking to achieve? And does that line up with the context of what they've set and also how they may have talked about where they're trying to get to? And so bridging the gap, if you will, or creating what I consider often to be bespoke uh, solutions are based on where are we? Where do we need to go? What's that gap? And what can I bring to the table from really many experiences over my career that is bespoke to that particular person, that organization that will help? Them? Awesome. Um, I think as we explore um, the shifts in work, um, uh, you're absolutely right that 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 coaches and and uh, consultants tend to to get called in when there's a problem, um, which is its own challenge, right? Um, uh, but but within that context and and overlaying that normal context of when we would be working with organizations anyways, with the fact that we are in a period of transition, we're in a period of pandemic where people are, are, um, are experimenting more with virtual work uh, and a high likelihood that once we come out of this, things won't just go back to the way they were, but you know, we're going to be embracing these new technologies on an ongoing basis. Uh, the nature of the workplace, the nature of work will be shifting and we have to conceive of these new futures. You overlay that with the already you know, existing challenges and gaps within organizations. That becomes a really tall order for any organizational leader and for the consultant coming in and trying to help them to navigate all of this uncertainty and to be successful. Uh, what what are your thoughts about um, shifts in the workplace, the nature of work, and, and where we're going in the future? And how, how do you think organizations can best prepare for and respond to some of these shifts? Let's take it back to the leader for a moment. And maybe in, in our context for what we're talking about, John, let's talk about the, uh, the CHRO or the chief talent officer. I, I just think it's a great way to focus what you said. You know, when I'm thinking about everything you just put together, that's overwhelming to me. I don't know how you feel about it, but for anyone, I believe in an organization, where we've been, all the things we've got to do, how do we get back to moving along now? Where do we take that? That can be a really overwhelming uh, number of, of experiences to think about. And how do we then translate that or bring an organization and its people along with that? That's why I like to think about the leader first, because it is from our leaders, I believe, that we truly touch the masses and can transform the organization for better or often for worse. So if we think about that leader, and in this case, if we talk about CHRO or chief talent officer for a moment, I think it is so easy and I've seen this many times when I look at an organization's competency model. There's 10, 20, 30, 100 competencies, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of competencies that we may be going after. And, and I think it's easy to get lost 
Where am I supposed to focus? So the first thing I would say is, it's really important in getting back to where we're going. Focus on one thing. Maybe we need to go beyond that and say focus on a few things, but focus on one big goal because that will really help get people around uh, where we're supposed to be going and some clarity on what they're supposed to be doing. The second thing that I think is important for a leader is there are going to be certain roles, especially as you come back, get back online, or even you've been online and you've been essential business and you've been busy anyway, but moving forward and moving further, I think there are mission critical roles. And so really important to deploy or uh, assign or distribute talent, really top talent to those mission critical roles. And then a back piece of that I would say is important to measure what success looks like today and how do we reinforce that? Because if we can do that, we're going to move the bar and continue the momentum perhaps of bringing people back in some form or another or focusing on that one or few things. And then lastly, I'd say as we keep moving, it's really an X and O. It's a block and tackle, managing performance. So really important to manage performance, to communicate with real-time feedback so that everyone knows how they're doing and where they're supposed to be going. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that performance management piece, um, because that's a challenge, I think, in the best of organizations. And we've seen a major shift um, over the last decade in terms of performance management, uh, in terms of having meaningful conversations, meaningful feedback, timely feedback, getting away from the annual performance appraisal uh, approach to more real-time performance management, uh, real-time discussions. Um, what has been your, your experience with organizations as they've been grappling with the shifting uh, approaches to performance management? Have they been open to these shifts? Are they adopting them? Are, they, are, are you working with organizations where they're pretty resistant and they're, they want to hold on to kind of the old annual review model? What, what have you seen? Yes, and it depends. And what I mean by that is, I mean, you, you bring up a great point. We have seen a shift in the past decade, and that really does capture it. I mean, literally like a new world. But it's interesting, within that space, I have experienced working with clients, everything from we're not moving yet, we want to see where this uh, trend lands, to we're blowing up our performance management system and process. We're not doing that anymore, the annual review. And we're going to do pulse survey and daily feedback check-ins. And that's how we're going to do feedback to we're not having a performance review anything anymore. It's just on the manager to really manage their people. And so everything in between across that continuum, if you will, some of it's worked, some of it hasn't, some of it's landed, some of it hasn't. And I think the reasons for that are the cases where it's been better embedded and we've seen success, at least in my experience with clients that I've done work with, have been where, again, I'll go back to context, where the organization really understands its historical context of what it's done, how it communicates where the change might be happening, and really piloting that change in so that it is not such a drastic, if you will, flip the light switch and we were one thing yesterday and today we've completely, uh, you know, abandoned that and adopted something new. That can be really tough. Now, I don't want to take away from certain organizations that are actually really good at that. They're very nimble, they're very flexible, and they're able to do that. But my general experience has been for greater success, those who have eased into a new way, been very communicative about what that looks like and why they're doing it, and piloted with training, if you will, and then reinforced and supported their leaders to have that more dynamic, ongoing feedback versus a once a year standard uh, written review that might be in the system. Those are the ones that have done better. Yeah, yeah, that, that's my experience too. Uh, and it does really depend on the context, the type of organization, the size, the stage of, of the organization, kind of its maturity. All these things matter. I was talking with another um, uh, 
uh, HR professional recently who was describing to me uh, after after college he'd gone off and worked for Goldman Sachs for a number of years. Then he'd gone and worked for a couple other big corporations, and then at, over time he he decided he wanted to be more of a generalist. He, he was a specialist in these other organizations. He decided he wanted to go into a more generalist role. He went to a smaller organization. Um, along his career path, he had experienced vastly different types of approaches to performance management um, from very complex systems like at Goldman, where, where um, they're constantly doing um, 360 feedback. Um, they're, it's very structured, very formal. Um, and their, their annual raises are very tightly connected into this ongoing feedback that they provide and how they, uh, not, not only what a, an individual employee receives in, term of feed, in terms of feedback, but also in how they're helping others to develop, they're, they're evaluated on that. Um, so they have, he, he went from a very formal system like that to another organization um, that, another large organization that was, uh, a little less formalized, but still had kind of the pulse approach, um, the daily approach that you were talking about. And then he landed in this smaller organization as an HR generalist that had responsibility for performance management. And they had nothing. They had really nothing. They didn't even do annual reviews. Um, and they had a lot of problems. And so he decided, I need to, I need to go in and I need to help uh, establish a performance management process and system, uh, train people, help them, help to build a culture of, of performance management. Uh, and initially his approach was to basically try to copy the Goldman model and do it in this smaller, you know, manufacturing organization. And to his credit, pretty quickly he realized how foolish he was <laughs> to try to just take that model <laughs> and move it over. And he, he quickly backtracked and he, he realized, wait a minute, we, we don't need anything nearly that complex. We just need to ask some basic questions and have some basic dialogue, some basic conversations and, and put mechanisms in place so those can happen and we can start to develop a culture. And since then, he's had great success and he's seen uh, uh, wonderful changes. So I share that just to illustrate really what you've been sharing too, that context matters, that we can't, there's no one size fits all. We can't just plug and play an approach at one organization to another organization. We have to know the history. We have to know the employee-employee relationship um, in the past. And then we need to design something that will lead um, to, to what will work for that organization uh, to drive higher levels of performance and help people uh, fulfill their potential. Um, thoughts, thoughts on that as it relates to yeah, your no, experience? I, first of all, Really appreciate the example. I think it's great. And what I most appreciate about what you shared, John, is the learning in that. Meaning, you know, with best intent, I might have done the exact same thing. Hey, this is an awesome model at this organization. I've seen it do great things. Let me go, you know, change some uh, bells and whistles here, but I'm just going to plug this into your organization because it worked great there and you're kind of similar to them. And so it's going to work great for you. And boom, it does. not So I really appreciate the learning and the pause, if you will, to kind of take a quick look back and say, ooh, you know what? This isn't working so well, but let me understand that. Why not? And what can I do with it? So I think that's the insight behind that is, is really helpful and, and hopefully, you know, move that next organization to a better place because of that. Organizations sometimes don't have the patience or the time to wait and figure that out. Uh, but I do appreciate sort of what I'll call, I think, is important, the flexibility. I do think, I'm, a, I'm definitely a proponent. I am a proponent that the old model of decades ago, if you will, that was in place for a long time for performance management is no longer uh, as relevant or as meaningful as it may have been during that period of time. I think we live in a different world today, and there are things we might appreciate, some aspects of those systems, but flexibility today is really important. The two things I would add would be uh, there needs to be a level of consistency, especially in a large, large organization, uh, because if, if we can't have consistency in your department as compared to my department, even though we're two different businesses in two different regions, but we're under the same umbrella of the same organization, then we have two very different experiences about how our performance is being managed. One, that's unfair. And two, that's really not developing people in a very good way. So consistency is pretty critical. The other thing I'd say is 
where is the accountability? At the end of the day, we have to be able to account uh, both for what we're getting from what we're trying to implement, but also how have we set up our managers, our leaders to implement and lead that system? Uh, because if we haven't, what are we doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in all of this, I think of how things have shifted in the past to where we are now. And I, and I start to think about where we're going in the future um, in, you know, thinking about disruptive technologies and innovations that have been occurring that have driven us towards a, a new normal in the, in the future of work already. And I feel like COVID is just accelerating that shift because it's forcing us to rely on technologies more. Um, thinking about the shift in the future of work, what does this, what does next look like? What is, what, what do we see um, in HR departments, people management departments, how will they need to respond to and adapt to this shift um, as we move into the future of work? That is the million dollar question perhaps, right? Now, I'm not a fan. I dislike some of the jargon that's come out of current times, social distancing, the new next, or what is the next normal. Someone said to me yesterday, a client said, I don't think we're going back to normal. At least in my organization, we're not. And here's what that means. So I first go back to, John, what do I think of when, when I think of HR? Well, what's the definition, if you will, of the function? Think about HR as a support function that needs to speak the language of the business and delivers on business objectives by enabling people. And so the next, whatever it may be, as I think about that is, first, HR needs to be thinking about what's our business strategy. We should know that already. Maybe it's changed in COVID or moving out of COVID or moving through COVID, but what is our business strategy? And then the next question is, how is HR delivering on that strategy through people? I think that's a really good roadmap, if you will, to follow. Maybe it's a little bit of a legend, you know, that's, that's guiding the map. Um, but then I think you get to short-term and long-term. Short term for me goes, what's the immediate focus? How do we acknowledge the current climate we're in, manage the speed or flow of what we've been doing um, based on recent impact and, and where we're moving? And then the question comes to be one of my favorite ones, which we should always be thinking about and always working on, but maybe we've lost some of that in current times, but it's again back to that future. How do we engage now to create the futures we once talked about or that we should be talking about now? Whatever it is that we want to do and operate in, we need to work on creating that now. Maybe not fully, but a piece of our time or a piece of our workforce needs to be working on that. Because if we don't, it's going to happen to us. And then we are reactive versus if we focus on it now and we work towards it, we are proactive and bringing us back around for me and potential selves. That goes to creating our future and making it. I love that. I love the focus on being proactive. We obviously don't have a crystal ball. We don't actually know what's going to happen. Um, and despite our best intentions, we probably will get things wrong and we will, we will stumble and we'll take two steps forward, one step back, but it's being proactive rather than being responsive and taking a kind of long-term strategic sustainable approach to how we will respond to the, the shifting context around us it's not about getting it all right. It's not about being perfect. Uh, it's, but it's about learning as we go and it's, a, it's about being proactive. So if, I think if we can do that, there will still be stumbles, uh, inevitable stumbles, but we will be in a better position to respond to um, the shifts that occur and we'll have healthier organizations uh, that will be in a better position um, to leverage their, the talents of their people in new ways um, ways that maybe we're not used to doing right now. Um, it has been a true pleasure talking with you. We're about out of time, but before we close today, uh, I just want to give you a chance to tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you, where they can find out about you and your uh, company and uh, things like that. Thanks for that, John. So the website is potentialselves.com all together. So two words, but together, the word potential and then selves, S-E-L-V-E-S, potentialselves.com. You could reach me by email at 
D-Day, that's D-D-A-Y, D-Day at PotentialSelves.com. You can look me up, LinkedIn, et cetera. I would be happy to connect with anyone. Excellent conversation, John. It's great to have colleagues like you uh, doing the work that you're doing because as I shared at the beginning, I think by working with leaders in organizations, we truly get to touch the masses of people that are out there that bring change to the world. And to me, that's a positive force. Thank you. Thank you. It has been an enlightening discussion. I really appreciate your expertise and sharing your experience. Um, I hope that we can have future conversations and uh, have the opportunity to work together in the future. So thank you so much. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.